A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, what more shall I say? I have not time to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, did what was righteous, obtained the promises. They closed the mouths of lions, put out raging fires, escaped the devouring sword. Out of weakness they were made powerful, became strong in battle, and turned back foreign invaders. Women received back their dead through resurrection. Some were tortured and would not accept deliverance in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others endured mockery, scourging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawed in two, put to death at sword's point. They went about in skins of sheep or goats, needy, afflicted, tormented. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered about in deserts and on mountains, in caves and in crevices in the earth. Yet all these, though approved because of their faith, did not receive what had been promised. God had foreseen something better for us, but that without us, so that without us they should not be made perfect. Verum Domini. Let your hearts take comfort, all who hope in the Lord. How great is the goodness, O Lord, which you have in store for those who fear you, and which toward those who take refuge in you, you show in the sight of the children of men. You hide them in the shelter of your presence from the plotting of men. You screen them from your abode, from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, whose wondrous mercy he has shown me in a fortified city. Once I said in my anguish, I am cut off from your sight, yet you heard the sound of my pleading when I cried out to you. Love the Lord, all you his faithful ones. The Lord keeps those who are constant but more than requits those who act proudly. Dominus Fabiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Marcum, Jesus and his disciples came to the other side of the sea to the territory of the Gerasenes. When he got out of the boat, at once a man from the tombs who had an unclean spirit met him. The man had been dwelling among the tombs, and no one could restrain him any longer, even with a chain. In fact, he had frequently been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles smashed, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. 
Night and day among the tombs and on the hillsides, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and prostrated himself before him, crying out in a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. He had been saying to him, Unclean spirit, come out of the man. He asked him, What is your name? He replied, Legion is my name. There are many of us. And he pleaded earnestly with him not to drive them away from that territory. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they pleaded with him, Send us into the swine. Let us enter them. So he let them, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea where they were drowned. The swine herds ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside. And people came out to see what had happened. As they approached Jesus, they caught sight of the man who had been possessed by legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And they were seized with fear. Those who witnessed the incident explained to them what had happened to the possessed man and to the swine. Then they began to beg him to leave their district. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed pleaded to remain with him. But Jesus would not permit him, but told him instead, Go home to your family and announce to them all that the Lord in his pity has done for you. Then the man went off and began to proclaim in the Decapolis what Jesus had done for him, and all were amazed. Verbum Domini Saturday, we began the classic biblical text on faith, Hebrews chapter 11. And if you're ever in a moment struggling with your faith, I'd encourage you to prayerfully read and meditate upon Hebrews chapter 11. And today we continue this chapter on faith And the author recounts the different Old Testament figures who were men and women of great faith. Gideon, Samson, David, Samuel. He says, who by faith conquered kingdoms and did what was righteous. Out of weakness, they were made powerful. Some were tortured and would not accept deliverance in order to obtain a better resurrection. This is probably a reference to the book of Maccabees in the Old Testament, where there were those who professed faith in the resurrection, life after death, even in the midst of their tortures, even before Christ had come. The world was not worthy of them. Yet all of these, though approved because of their faith, did not receive what had been promised. God foresaw something better for us so that without us, they should not be made perfect. It was not until Jesus opened the way to glory did the righteous of the Old Testament enter into the inheritance that they could see from a distance. Already in the book of Maccabees, they're professing their faith in life after death. We see this also in the book of Wisdom in the wisdom literature, but they were seeing it from a distance. It was not until Christ came and he opened up the way to glory to heaven that then they could obtain what they foresaw uh, from a distance. And let us look at this uh, virtue of faith. St. Thomas Aquinas says this of faith. He says, someone may object that it is foolish to believe what he cannot see. Yet life in this world would be altogether impossible if we were to believe only what we see. How can we live without believing others? How is a man to believe that his father is so-and-so? 
Hence, man finds it necessary to believe others in matters that he cannot know perfectly on his own. And so you and I, we don't know from experience who our fathers are. There's evidence that the man who lived in our home, who cared for us, maybe there's even a resemblance that we have to our fathers. All of this evidence points to the truth of what our mothers told us, of what we were told, that this man is your father. But we don't know it because we saw that that's the fact. And there are many things. We could say the whole study of history, that we really have to take it on the witness, the testimony of others. And the more witnesses that we have, the more solid that uh, testimony is. What is one of the most historically uh, testified to events but the Gospels? We have so many uh, witnesses in the Gospel testimony, written testimonies from the early centuries after Christ with very little variation and no, no really significant ones that speak of the truth of Christ, the truth of his life, his death, his miracles, his resurrection from the dead. And so Thomas Aquinas is pointing out, even on a human level, we have to accept what others tell us. We can't know everything just by our own experience. We have to accept it in faith. And the more trustworthy that that person is, the more solid we are in accepting that. What we heard on Saturday of faith It said that that Abraham believed. Even God had made him a promise that he was going to be the father of a great nation, even though he's beyond the age and his wife is beyond the age. But he believed that the one who made the promise was trustworthy. He believed the one who had made the promise was trustworthy. Do you believe that God is trustworthy? That he never lies? that what he says is true. And that's really what faith is. It's say, I believe as Abraham, our father in the faith, believed. And we are told that Abraham believed and obeyed. You know, that word obedience comes from the word obedire, to hear. It's to listen, that we are seeking God's will. We're seeking his plan in our life. And as we come to understand it, then we're going to carry it out. That's what faith is. And we should face everything in life with faith. That there are troubles, there are difficulties that we face in life, but we must face them all with faith. Here's a word from St. Padre Pio. He says, the most beautiful act of faith is the one made in darkness, in sacrifice, and with extreme effort. And so in life, when we sometimes have tragedy or difficulties, we're going to face it with faith. With the faith that says, God, I believe that you exist. God, I believe in your goodness. God, I believe that you have my best in mind. And that you only allow or permit tragedy and evil and hardship only because you can turn that in some way to my betterment, to my spiritual benefit, to my eternal welfare. I believe. And so we face everything with that faith that we see in the great ones of old. All of these were approved because of their faith. And this chapter also says, without faith it's impossible to please God. Here are words of blessed Charles de Foucault. It is nearly always faith which our Lord praises and rewards. Sometimes he praises love, sometimes humility, but this is rare. Faith, though not the supreme virtue, charity holds that place, is nevertheless the most important because it is the basis of all the others, charity included. And it is the rarest, real faith, faith which inspires all one's actions, faith in the supernatural which strips the world of its mask and reveals God in everything, 
which makes meaningless the words impossible, anxiety, danger, and fear. How rare that is, real faith. Real faith that he says that makes meaningless the words impossible, anxiety, danger, and fear. How rare that is, a real, a real faith that we find. Now, in light of today's saint that we celebrate, St. John Bosco, there's another passage from the New Testament that regards faith that I would also, that I think is very apropos for today's saint, St. John Bosco. And it's from the letter of James. If a brother or sister is ill clad in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. So yes, we believe, and there are reasons for our belief, that it's not just some sort of wishful thinking. We see such so much evidence of God and the reality of God. I like something that Peter Kreeft says that, God does not give us so much light regarding his existence that we are forced to accept him. And he does not give us too little light, so little light that we could never find him. But he gives us just enough light so that those who have the good will and desire to seek him and to live in accord with his will will find him. That's faith. So we do believe because we do see evidence. Because by our own baptism, we've been given the gift of faith, a share in God's knowledge of himself. But this faith then must be put into practice. It must be working through love. And this is what we see in this great saint that we celebrate today, St. John Bosco, who has been called the man who changed the world. You know, the Salesians are the second largest religious order in the world. And one of the reasons why we can say that the Catholic Church is the largest charitable organization in the world, in large part we can credit also the Salesians and their work. We have them in our own diocese here in Birmingham. Some 40,000 members, priests, brothers, sisters, and uh, Salesian cooperators uh, through in a, over 130 countries throughout the world, engaged in charitable works. <clears throat> and of St. John Bosco, who lived in the 19th century, <clears throat> he died at the age of 72 on this day, 1888. Pope Pius XI, who knew him as a young priest and who was the one that beatified and canonized him, said this, he said, God gave him a magnanimity of heart as great as the sand on the seashore. Magnanimity means a greatness of soul, a greatness of heart that wants to do great things for God. And this is what Pius XI said characterized the heart of St. John Bosco. As a young child, his father had died when he was only two years old. And so his, fa- his family very much struggled. He grew up very poor. Well, one of the talents that he developed was becoming an expert juggler and acrobat. And he would put on different shows for children and adults. And for payment, he would only ask them to say some prayers or to go to Mass that day. That was the payment that he wanted. He had a great sense of humor. And there is a story of how, because he was so good as an acrobat and as a juggler and different things that he could do, that he was sent by the boarding school uh, director, sent sent to the priest because he said he must be in league with the devil because of these different tricks that he was able to do. And so young John Bosco went there to meet with the priest, and the priest asked him to answer these charges against him. And 
John, little John Bosco said, well, what time is it? And the priest went to look at his watch, and it was missing. He had taken it off in the handshake. <laughs> and so they had a good laugh about it, and he just explained to him that, no, that wasn't the case at all. It was at the age of nine that he had a vision, a dream, in which he saw his vocation, his future vocation of helping poor street boys. And from that time on, he was determined to become a priest and was ordained at the age of 26. It was at this time in Italy, in the 19th and mid-19th century, that child labor was prevalent all over Europe. And from the age of seven onward, young boys were often sent to work in the factories long, hard hours. Some of these boys were orphans who slept in empty houses or on the streets. Some came from large families with widowed mothers or with disabled fathers, and they were helping to provide for the needs of their own families. But all of them were poor And many of them were continually getting into trouble because they didn't have any direction or guidance. And so Don Bosco, as a priest, invited one of these young street boys to come with his friends to church, and he would teach them prayers. And so he showed up the next week with four other ragged street boys. Soon the group grew to 30. He fed them, sheltered them, clothed them, taught them catechism and how to read and write. His motto was, give me souls and take away the rest. And he would use a preventative system of education, teach them to do good, remove them from their bad surroundings. And how much better this is. You know, there is a movement today, the Cristo Ray schools that I've talked about in the past, the charter schools, to set up schools in the inner cities to help have a preventative system of education so that you don't just try to cure the sickness where people reach a point where they have to be imprisoned, but that you are educating them so as to prevent them from leading a life of dissolution and of crime to teach them to do good, to remove them from their bad surroundings. And looking on the Salesian website, and feast day greetings to all of our Salesian brothers and sisters uh, throughout the world. On their website, they have this, the educational philosophy of John Bosco can be condensed in three words, reason, religion, and kindness. The basic principle of his system was a deep understanding and love for young people and their problems. We heard in today's Office of Readings this letter of St. John Bosco. And he said to other members of his order, First of all, if we wish to appear concerned about the true happiness of our foster children and if we would move them to fulfill their duties, You must never forget that you are taking the place of the parents of these beloved young people. I have always labored lovingly for them and carried out my priestly duties with zeal, and the whole Salesian society has done this with me. My sons, in my long experience, very often I had to be convinced of this great truth. It is easier to become angry than to restrain oneself and to threaten a boy than to persuade him. Yes, indeed, it is more fitting to be persistent in punishing our own impatience and pride than to correct the boys. We must be firm but kind and to be patient with them. In fact, when he was ordained to the priesthood, one of the resolutions he made was that the sweetness and charity of St. Francis de Sales would guide him in everything. And this was the reason why he called the congregation that he would found the Congregation of the Salesians of St. Francis de Sales, or the Congregation of St. Francis de Sales. We call them the Salesians, not the Boscoans, although we recognize John Bosco as their founder. <clears throat> After seeing a vision of 
starving and poor girls who pleaded for help, Don Bosco, together with St. Mary Mazzarello, founded the Salesian Sisters, and he also began a group of lay people known as the Salesian Cooperators. A number of years here in Birmingham, a brother, uh, Charles Todell, was involved with the Salesian Cooperators. He's now gone on to his eternal reward, and for a short time as an engineer, I was involved with the Cooperators and their their good work uh, for the good of young people. Toward the end of his life, many urged Don Bosco to slow down, to which he replied, first tell the devil to rest, and then I will rest too. Today's gospel reminded us of the reality of evil, but we see that Jesus is the one who conquers evil. Tomorrow, as the letter to the Hebrews continues, we will hear these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also rid ourselves of every burden and sin which clings so closely to us, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter, of our faith. Let us, my brothers and sisters, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Let us persevere in running this race. Continue to be men and women of great faith who put that faith into action through charity in whatever way the Lord wants to use us this day and the rest of our days. It may not be in starting some great uh, group as St. John Bosco did. It may be in very simple little ways. First of all, it must begin in our own homes, the practice of charity. It can be, as St. John Bosco said, to let the sweetness and charity of St. Francis de Sales guide us in all things, in our relationship with other people, in our interaction with other people this day. But let all of us put our faith into action, faith working through love, May St. John Bosco help us to do this. And one day, may we join this great cloud of witnesses, the saints of old and the saints that we celebrate today. And may we join them all in keeping our eyes fixed on the Lord forever in glory in the beatific vision. Amen.